Well, it truly is a blessing to be here in person and to see you all face to face. We at Covenant have been praying for you uh, often. I have kept you in my prayers. Pastor Tom and I pray together uh, usually every Saturday. Sometimes we, we give each other a call at some point on Saturdays and pray for each other's ministries. And so uh, it's been a year of kindling a certain affection for you in my heart. And this morning we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 2 as we are... I know that Pastor Tom gave you an Advent sermon last week, but it is that season, so we'll do another Advent-themed sermon service here. Matthew 2, verses 1 through 8. I'm sorry, 1 through 18. Matthew 2, 1 through 18. And this is going to be more of a topical sermon, so don't expect a, a detailed explanation of the passage here. We'll... You'll, you'll see what I mean by this in a moment, but uh, um, this, is, this is at least where we will go for now. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 18. Hear God's word as I read it. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of, Judea, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a scepter who will, rule, or who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men and secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or young or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord, our God, endures forever. Let's say a brief prayer. Lord, I do pray that as we have heard your word, that your spirit would implant it deeply into our hearts, that we would, that we would see fresh grace, fresh insights that might uh, strengthen us, that might sanctify us in your truth. Father, apply it to our hearts, that we might repent from our sin and draw near to you, for you are far far more worthy and far more desirable than anything that this world has to offer. We pray to this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, around Christmas time, we tend to focus on two different doctrines or themes in the Bible. Uh, the first is what we might call Christ's incarnation, that astonishing reality that Jesus, that, that frankly God, God became a person. He came, became a, not a person, a human. <laughs> he took on flesh. The infinite took on the finite Certainly an astonishing reality that we celebrate around Christmas time. Although, for our purposes this morning, the other doctrine or biblical theme that we talk about around Christmas time is this idea or this theme of Advent. What usually comes to mind when we think of Advent? We might think of Advent calendars and other Advent 
uh, festivities that we do during the days and weeks prior to Christmas. It's usually a fun and festive time of singing. Uh, I believe historically it was uh, a time of, of, of fasting, and so Advent has been celebrated differently through, through the years. But I think today we tend to associate it with boxes of chocolates and, and sweet things like that, don't we? Um, Advent comes from the Latin word adventus, which means arrival, arrival. So Advent is about that long-expected Jesus, and it's, it's not, not so much about his arrival as it is about waiting for his arrival. We are waiting for the Messiah to come. So we often like to think about and even act out the process that God's people went through as they waited for the Messiah to come. That's, that's what we do with the, the box of chocolates and fun activities. We, we try to feel that anticipation that God's people must have felt in the, those, those years before Jesus came. And uh, with those chocolates and fun activities, I suppose that we're trying to associate waiting for the Messiah with sweet things, right? It's sweet to wait upon God's promises. But what if I told you that when you trace the theme of Advent through the Bible, you'll find a, you'll find a bi- battleground. You will find a battleground. You're going to find trickery and battles and bloodshed. And yes, you're even going to find a story of a dragon. <laughs> you will find dragons. What if I told you that that is what Advent is, if you really take a good look at it in the Bible? Uh, today I want to do four things. I want to define what we mean by Advent. Uh, what does this mean to wait upon God, biblically speaking? What did that look like for the people of old? God's arrival, yes, but more generically, what does it mean to wait upon God's, arrival, uh, upon God's promises in this capacity? So what do we mean by Advent? And then secondly, let's talk about the origins of Advent. When did this whole thing begin? Where where did waiting on God's promises in this capacity begin? And then we'll look at the story of Advent. So we see the origins, and then we'll kind of trace it, the story of Advent through the Bible, and then we'll think about how this applies to us today. So what do we mean by Advent, the origins of Advent, the story of Advent, and how does this apply to us today? Um, that's where we're going this morning. What do we mean by Advent? Adventus, waiting upon God. What do we mean by that? So again, in my experience around Christmas time, we... We, uh, we tend to think about Advent in terms of the 400 years of silence from God before Jesus came. Right? We often think uh, 400 years of darkness. God is not, he, he has not spoken to God's people. The people of Israel are waiting uh, for 400 years. Um, we might think God was with his people from the days of Moses to the last prophetic word spoken through Malachi and then silence. It's almost as if God had left or seemed to leave. And Advent is a matter of waiting and still quiet silence as God was quiet for 400 years, and Israel waits in darkness. Now, in your experience, is that Advent? Is that, is that waiting? Is that what it looks like to wait upon the Lord for him to fulfill his promises? Waiting in still, quiet silence. In fact, to push this a little bit further, should we even refer to Advent as only those 400 years of, of, of that 400-year wait marked by no word from God? So, Yes, 400 years of silence, but is that Advent? I mean, was there more to Advent than, than that? Um, and by the way, it wasn't just 400 years of silence, quiet, sitting, twiddling your thumbs, right? Those, if you look at the, those 400 years, they were 400 years of misery for, for the people of Israel in many respects. Um, as I'm going to show you in a moment, Advent began in the Garden of Eden, folks. That's why we read Genesis 3 in a moment, a moment ago. Advent began in the garden. In the garden, as we read in the Old Testament reading, God, as we read that in, in Genesis 3, God promised the serpent that an offspring of the woman would crush his head. An offspring of the serpent would crush his head. God revealed that a savior would come and destroy the serpent and redeem a people to himself. And so begins the season of Advent, folks. So begins the waiting. Way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve heard news of a deliverer that would come and they were therein resigned to wait upon God, to wait upon his promises, Advent. That's Advent. That is the story of the Old Testament, isn't it? If you're ever wondering, how can I discover fresh material for another season, another year of Advent? How do I fill my mind with that wonder and, 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 and thought of waiting upon God and, and anticipating the Messiah's arrival? Um, just open up to your Old Testament anywhere and consider what it was life like for these 
what life was like for these Old Testament saints to wait upon God's promises. It's the whole Old Testament. Advent is about Adam and Eve waiting. It is about Abraham waiting. It's about Isaac and Jacob and Joseph waiting. It's about King David and Esther, all of the faithful remnants of God's people who have gone before us, who waited patiently for God to fulfill his promises that a Messiah would indeed come. And it was a long, long wait, wasn't it? Um, But let me ask you this. If you read their stories, would you characterize their stories as waiting and still quiet, easy, and sweet like a box of chocolates sort of waiting? (laughs) Read their stories, right? That's not Advent, folks, um, in and of itself. They experienced strife. They experienced opposition. That opposition was not merely worldly opposition. It was even demonic. It was from that great serpent, the devil, the dragon. Think about it. If you received a promise from God that a man would soon come from the woman and crush your head, do you think that that might make you a little paranoid and edgy? Do you think you would keep your eyes peeled for a unique child to come from the woman? Do you think you might make life hard for that woman who at any time could become pregnant with your demise? Hence, this woman, God's people, saw oppression from the devil from the moment the offspring was promised to the moment the offspring arrived. Advent is nothing less than, it's more than this, but it's nothing less (laughs) Then a bloody, demonic battleground right up to the point when Jesus arrived. What happens when when Jesus was born, by the way, in those early years of his life? This is where our passage comes into play today. Uh, We read Matthew 2 there. You heard the story. Um, Matthew 2, picking up in round uh, verse 16 there. Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, why? Because he wanted to destroy that child. He saw that he'd been tricked by the wise men. He became furious. He sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all that region who were two years old or under. Verse 17, then, he was fil- then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. It's quite appalling, an appalling I- image here, isn't it? But it's not merely the work of Herod. It's the work of the devil, and it's the same work that the devil has been doing since he first heard of the promised Messiah. Our passage that we read ties in with this theme of Advent by showing us what it looked like for God's people to wait in this long season of Advent. It involved receiving hard blows from the serpent as the serpent sought to thwart God's plans. Just to get a little more concrete and clear to you, uh, you could turn to Revelation chapter 12. Um, if, you want, if you had your Bibles, you can turn there in Revelation 12. This chapter describes God's people as a woman in labor with a male child who would rule the nations. And it describes the devil as a dragon. Again, it's a dragon story, right? Revelation 12, a little halfway th- through verse 1 there. A woman is clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, And on her head, a crown of 12 stars. This beautiful woman, Christ's bride here. She was pregnant and she was crying out in birth pains and 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 in the agony of giving birth, perhaps maybe to the Messiah. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars in heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before that woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour her. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Again, Psalm 2, we just read, uh, sang Psalm 2, didn't we? This child who would rule the nations with a rod of iron, Jesus, a ruler of the nations, who is to crush the head of the serpent. Does that sound familiar? Perhaps maybe when the devil moved King Herod to destroy the baby Jesus? But think about the imagery here. This woman is for some time crying out in child pain. This is the church. She's crying out. She's pregnant with the promised Messiah. And I don't think it's a stretch to say that the birth pain she's experiencing is the opposition that she's receiving from the devil, from the world, and frankly, from within God's own people who are constantly refusing to trust in God's promises. From the garden 
all the way to the baby, Jesus being uh, as a baby boy, the devil sought to destroy the promised child and his heritage. And that's what waiting for the Messiah looked like for God's people. It looked like a great battle between a damsel in distress and a dragon seeking to destroy her. At times, the woman's situation seemed hopeless. And yet, because of God's faithfulness and his power to make good on his promises and his power over the dragon, we see in the end a beautiful and awe-inspiring story of victory. God's people would wait upon God, not in silence, but through great opposition. And the story ends with a clear message that God's purposes and his power cannot be thwarted. And that's what we celebrate in Advent. So let's bring this home today. Even after the Messiah has come, um, just generically speaking, waiting on God is hard, isn't it? It's hard. Um, it's hard to wait upon his peace when you, when you lose your job. It's hard to wait upon his strength when you're fighting sin or when you're, when you're exhausted and you don't have strength to go to another day of work. It's hard to wait upon, frankly, his second coming. How many times do you find, as you're watching the news, Maranatha, Lord, come soon, please. This is miserable. It's hard to wait upon God. God's people have never been promised easy lives. If anything, we've been promised hard lives, lives of persecution and distress. We trust in a word, in, in God's word, that the devil hates and that the world hates because the word condemns them. But God's word of promise cannot be thwarted. Even Herod's decree could not kill the baby boy. Uh, Peter reminds us, uh, the apostle Peter, he says, Do not overlook this one fact that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, as some count slowness. God does make good on his promises without fail. And as, you, as, we, as we look at the story of Advent through the Bible, all of the opposition be awed at the power of God, and that the same God is working the same delivery, the same promises to you in Jesus Christ. Um, that's what Advent is. It's, that's, that's what's involved with it here. It's waiting upon God's promises according to his good purposes and his timing. And I don't say this, by the way, <laughs> I don't say this to say that you should not buy Advent calendars with chocolates and celebrate during Advent season. I don't say this to tell you to associate Advent only with opposition and that you should put your kids through a gauntlet of trials between December 1st and December 25th. Um, that's not what I have in mind here. Uh, the awesome paradox is that while Advent is characterized by opposition, it's opposition that God is and always has been victorious over, right? Even David himself, in the midst of his enemies, says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have promised, and so it will be. God, you are God of gods. You are Lord of lords. You are heaven you are, you are Lord of heaven and earth. You have all power. When you speak, so it will be. God speaks promises of deliverance and salvation that he will render all accounts of injustices complete at the end of time, and it will so be. And so when we experience enemies, as the, as the Proverbs 31 woman says or does, we laugh at the days ahead because Jesus is victorious. And so, yes, Advent in the Bible is characterized by opposition, and yet because God has spoken, it's characterized by victory. Um, God has promised salvation. He's promised forgiveness of sin so that we can be at peace with God. He's promised strength. He's promised perseverance. Is this not something to crack a box of chocolates open for and to toast to? Rejoice and be glad. My God has spoken, so it will be. Yet do not grow weary in your fight against your struggle, right? Do not grow weary. Rejoice. Do not grow weary. Rejoice. Feel, the, feel the, the, the weight of Advent, and yet feel the weight of God's promises. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing here. So what about the origins of Advent? When did the season of waiting through adversity for the Messiah begin? I already gave you the answer. Uh, it began in the Garden of Eden, but I want you to look. Uh, let's, let's think about this a little bit more in, in depth here. Uh, Genesis 3, that was our Old Testament reading. If you want to turn there, you can, but um, you know the story. We just defined Advent as a matter of waiting upon God to fulfill his promises, even through adversity. So you might expect that um, 
when we go to Genesis 3 and this, this, the beginnings of this advent, uh, you, we might find opposition or trials. And there in Genesis 3, we see that the first trial that mankind ever faced was from the devil, the serpent, whose mission was to overthrow God from his throne. But notice what the devil does in order to oppose God, right? So we define advent, there's this, this matter of opposition involved here. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very sober waiting upon God as we're being afflicted in many ways. What does that opposition actually look like? We'll go to Genesis 3. What does he do there? He goes to God's people and he questions God's word before them. That's what he does. Verse 1, that well-known verse, the devil says, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did he actually say that? The first thing God does to oppose his his, oppose God and his people is just to get us thinking about the validity and the fairness of God's word. One way the devil gets you to stop waiting upon God and his promises is to qu- get you to question his promises, get you to question his word. That's how this works. But then once he has you thinking, and once you're willing to mince God's word, the devil will then altogether contradict God's word. Verses 4 and 5 of Genesis 3 there. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. Is that what God said? Well, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Isn't that interesting? First, there's outright rejection of God's word. Sin will not kill you. That's what the devil says. It's a lie. But then he suggests worldliness to you. He says, when you eat of it, you will get the world. You will have your eyes open. You will be able to know good and evil. You'll be like God. You will have power and wisdom and freedom and joy. Oh, and it will not kill you. It will give you life. Why wait, right? That's how how the devil opposes God's people as we are being called to wait in Advent, to wait upon the Lord. That's how the devil works. Paul says we should not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. (laughs) We know what this is, what this looks like. Satan's designs are tailor-made to thwart God's word and his promises to get us to stop trusting in him. He deceives us to destroy us. He deceives us to destroy us. And we see that over and over again in scripture. That that is the scheme that puts us and all of mankind, that's what put us into the curse. Adam sinned under this. We all fell into it. In Adam all die. And that's where God's mercy comes into it. Genesis 3 verse 14 In light of all this, God comes to Adam and Eve. You see three series of curses in Genesis 3. You see in verse 14 there, God curses the serpent, and then he curses the woman, and then he curses the man. But it is in that curse of the serpent where we get mercy. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So the devil there is cursed, and he's humiliated to the ground to eat dust, but also he's confronted with this problem. He'll have enmity, or strife, or war with the woman. And not only with the Satan and the woman, perhaps Eve, but with Satan's offspring and Eve's offspring. Um, a lot of people have asked me questions, like, what do we mean, the devil's offspring? What do we, what do we mean? We get Eve, she has offspring, but the devil has, what, what's going on there? Uh, one person puts it this way, those understood as opposing the purposes of God and his people appear in the Bible to be regarded as the seed of the serpent. You're opposing God, you're a son of the devil. As we press into the biblical story, that's what we see. Essentially, humanity is broken into two families that are not bound by blood, but by loyalties. The offspring of the woman identified by love towards God and the offspring of the devil, identified by those who love the devil in his ways. And it's often shocking to see who is identified with, with the serpent, right? Jesus arrives, the Pharisees, remember what he calls them? You brood of vipers. You're of your, you're, you, uh, if God were your father, you would love me, but you are of your father, the devil. You're his offspring, Pharisees religious leaders leading God's people in Israel. How do people, even the Jewish people in the Old Testament, with all of these privileges, how do we fall into that situation? Obviously, 
not trusting, no faith. But more specifically, we forget God's word. We challenge God's word. We twist God's word and we stop waiting upon God's word and his promises. That's how, God got, that's how Satan got this whole thing going. Advent is about confidently, joyfully, and diligently waiting upon God's word, tending to his word without being distracted by the latest politics, without being distracted by the latest new gadgets, without being distracted by whatever modern interpretation of the Bible there may be at any given time. So we have enmity between the devil and the woman, between the devil's offspring, the woman's offspring. We also have a glimpse into the devil's schemes there in Genesis 3. What does this opposition look like? Trying to get you distracted from the word. But don't miss the real season of Advent there. The end of verse 15. He, that is a single male offspring from the woman, he will bruise or he will break your head and you shall only bruise his heel. In other words, the devil will harm the future male descendants of the woman, but that man will give a mortal blow to the head of the serpent. You see the promise? And can you see why when we turn to Revelation 12, the devil is portrayed as stooping over the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. Do you see why the devil might incite Herod to kill every child two years and younger in Bethlehem? Do you see why Advent might become such a bloody battleground? So we've seen what Advent is, and we've seen the origins of Advent. Let's just think of a few stories of how this really pans itself out throughout the biblical story. Let me just give you a flash of the headlights right through the, through the Bible here. So just kind of get a feel for this, the weightiness of it, of, of, the, of the opposition, but of God's promises. Over and over and over again, God shows himself faithful. You might be quick to guess that the showdown between the devil, devil's offspring and the, the woman's offspring just does not take long to peek its head after Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden. Right away, the, devil's, the, the devil jumps on the first victim that he can, the firstborn child of Adam and Eve. Is that the offspring, right? For all Satan knew, the woman's offspring to destroy him could be the first child born to Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel. Satan enlists Cain to his ranks and Cain kills Abel who seemed to show favor toward God who showed himself to be a true offspring of the woman who was loyal to God. Jesus actually refers to this event in passing when he condemns the Pharisees and contributes Abel's death to Satan rather than Cain. If you remember this, Jesus says, you Pharisees are of your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning. What are we talking about? Satan, through Cain, opposing God's people, killing Abel. And Adam and Eve, no doubt, quickly learned that this whole advent, I mean, if, you, if you're in that situation, you're Adam and Eve, you're thinking, God has promised that a deliverer will come through our offspring, so let's start having kids, right? So here's, a, here's my kid. Here, I'm going to name him uh, 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 Cain, meaning I have gotten this offspring, right? The, the emphasis is I have done this, I have done this. And that person who you thought you brought into the world to save yourself, offspring of the devil. So Cain and Abel quickly, or, uh, Adam and Eve quickly learn, God must make good on God's promises on his term, and my job is to wait. My job is to open-handedly trust in God's promises and see what God does. And so finally, at the end of Genesis 4, Adam and Eve name their child Seth, meaning God has appointed for me another son. God has done this. He must make good on his promises. It's Advent. We have no control over whether and when, well, we have no control over how and when God will make good on those promises. Then, of course, this, there's the story of God, how, the story of how God kept the family of his promise through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Those are stor <laughs> thrilling stories, to say the least. Um, those Advent stories. The lineage of Messiah would end up in, in the Egypt to, be, to find unbelievable opposition from the devil there. If you remember the, the opening pages of Exodus, a pharaoh, a pharaoh who did not know Joseph took over the throne in Egypt and found that he was being overtaken by many Israelites. These Israelites were overpopulating, too many offspring. And of course, Pharaoh solved this problem by decreeing that every male child among the Hebrews, uh, every firstborn male should be killed. God did not respond lightly to this gesture. Um, but for the record, do you remember what image the Pharaoh used as a symbol of his power? Um, he used the symbol of the serpent. 
that great dragon opposing God's people, even through worldly kingdoms. Then there's King David's encounter with the serpent. Any idea what story I might be talking about here? This is actually a fascinating one. King David, hmm, serpent. 1 Samuel 17, David and Goliath. It's actually a fascinating thing here as we connect it to this battle between the seed of the woman and the serpent. You all know the story. This giant man named Goliath was mocking Israel and Israel's God. Nobody dared to confront this massive man. So this little shepherd boy, David, comes in with a stone and a sling. (laughs) That'll do it, right? Now, here's what people often miss. First, the story describes Goliath's armor with a very rare word, the word that the Bible uses to describe a serpent's or a dragon's scales. So here's this massive man scaled with serpentine armor. Like a, he's, he's clothed like a serpent. And then, second, the boy who would soon be anointed as king's, uh, Israel's king and who is in the line of the Messiah, what does he do? He crushes the head of this giant, scaled giant's head with a stone. Now, without going into more details that might prove this point, this linkage here, uh, we see the serpent's futile attempts to mock and snuff out the seed of the woman. Goliath uh, was intentionally portrayed as a serpent-like figure, perhaps the seed of the woman, uh, the seed of the serpent, and his head was crushed. God will make good on his promises, but David was not the guy. He could not deliver Israel. Moving on, we find the story of Esther and Haman. Um, massive story of the seed of the woman. I mean, Israel cast, uh, kicked out of the promised land. They were surrounded by the seed of the serpent. God made good on his promises. And then, of course, Jesus. How did he treat the false creatures? You brood of vipers. Your father is the devil. When Jesus arrived in God's holy city, the city had been overtaken by offspring of the serpent. Literally, demon possession seemed commonplace everywhere. Jesus was casting unclean spirits out of synagogues. He literally called them synagogues of Satan. Satan had led the Jews to teach lies, to twist the truth of God for a lie, all to destroy God's people and the holy offspring. But then, of course, the Israelites were not only taught by seed of the serpent, they were ruled by the serpent. Herod himself, like Pharaoh, would seek to snuff out the promised Messiah. And that is the story of Advent, the coming of the Messiah. That's what it looks like for God's faithful remnant to wait upon God for his promised offspring to destroy the serpent. It's a story of adversity of enmity between the Satan's offspring and the woman's offspring. But Christ came, and he won. And there was no, no challenge. He sent Jesus, God sent his eternal son, Jesus, into the flesh to destroy the the devil and redeem a people from their sins. As, As Christ himself even said, no one takes my life from me, not even Herod, not even the devil. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to lay it, take it back up. And he did this for our sins and that we might be declared righteous in God's sight. So we've seen that Advent is a story of waiting upon the promised Messiah through adversity. We've seen that it began in the devil when the devil first began to use his tactics of twisting God's word, getting us to question God's word of promise so that we would not tend to that word of promise. Brothers and sisters, tend closely to the Bible. Tend closely to it. Memorize those promises that are designed to keep you faithful to him through all adversities so that you might wait upon him, especially when it's hard. And of course, that does just bring us to how does this apply to us today? How does this apply to us today? We are called to rejoice in the victory that God has purchased for us in Christ. The Messiah has come, and so eat those box of chocolates and rejoice, and yet do not do it without a sense of sober-mindedness. Yes, the devil has been defanged, if you will. He cannot accuse you before God in heaven. You are standing on Christ's righteousness. He has been defanged. He cannot appeal to death to take you into his ranks. But yet, God calls us to be sober-minded. He is raging around the world like a roaring lion. And what does he do? Well, as we might expect, he's doing what he's always been doing. He's twisting God's word. Um, Let me close with uh, the words of a man named A.W. Pink. This is from his book, Satan and the Gospel. Pink says in this book that Satan's work no longer is a work of anticipation, as though he's anticipating the Messiah's arrival and seeking to snuff that out. 
The devil's work now is a work of imitation. He seeks to lead God's people astray by imitating God and his gospel as much as possible and then tweaking it so that we would no longer tend to it faithfully. A.W. Pink says this, The gospel of Satan is not a system of revolutionary principles, nor yet a program of anarchy. Sometimes it is. It does not promote strife and war, but often aims at peace and unity. It seeks not to set the mother against the daughter, nor the father against the son. It fosters the fraternity spirit, the fraternal spirit, whereby the human race is regarded as one great brotherhood. It does not seek to drag down the natural man, but to improve and uplift him. It advocates education and cultivation and appeals to the best that is within us. It aims to make this world such a comfortable and a congenial habitat that Christ's absence from it will not be felt and God will not be needed. It endeavors to occupy man so much with this world that he has no time or inclination to think of the world to come. It propagates the principles of self-sacrifice, charity, and benevolence and teaches us to live for the good of others and to be kind to all. It appeals strongly to the carnal mind and is popular with the masses because it ignores the solemn facts that by nature man has fallen creatures alienated from the life of God, dead in its trespasses and sins, and that its only hope lies in being born again. This is Satan's work. Not necessarily a work of anticipation. He knows his time is short. So he appeals to a work of imitation. And it is still nonetheless a work of subtly twisting God's word that we might no longer cherish it and wait upon it. So brothers and sisters, do not mince God's words during this time of Advent. Tend to it carefully and relish in the victory that it proclaims to you and all the promises that it has secured for you. And then do do tend to his promises Tend to his commands patiently as you trust in him with a certain sober-mindedness knowing that adversity may ever always be at hand until Christ returns. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the promises that you have given us. That you did indeed promise the Messiah and that you made good on that promise. That you promised forgiveness and that you made good on that promise. That you promised your spirit of strength and peace and help and, and hope And you make good on those things to us every single day. And Lord, may we appeal on our knees by faith every day to these things. May we tend to your word and not take it lightly. May we not not, not subtly twist it in any way whatsoever. And Father, may we therein learn to wait upon you, even as we are waiting for Christ to come again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.